morning, church. We're grateful to be with you this morning in the house of the Lord. Whoo, can I hear an amen? Amen. Jesus, we love you. God, we love you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this place today. We are here for you. We fix our eyes on you. We turn our attention to you. Have your way in this place on earth as it is in heaven. This is our prayer this morning. Have your way. Yeah. Have your way. Have your way Lord. Holy Spirit, come. You are welcome here. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our song be a sign. We are here for you. Your breath come from heaven, fill our hearts with your life. We are here for you, Lord. We are here for you. To you, let's sing that out. To you, our hearts are open.
some praise this morning. Yeah, we love you, Lord. Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Well, welcome to River City Church this morning. We hope that you guys encounter the presence of God like never before. And um, a couple of uh, just quick updates and quick announcements, and then we'll head right back into this thing. As you all know, Pastor Andrew was not here this morning. Um, so we went to Chicago to see Judah, his oldest son, graduate from boot camp. And that was awesome. So um, that was really cool. But what we didn't know was that Judah was going to be able to get a couple more days of, of, of leave, a couple more days of liberty. And so because of that, Pastor and Andrew, uh, Pastor and Andrew? No, Pastor Andrew and Shauna um, stayed in Chicago for a couple more days so they can spend some more time with Judah before he, um, before he does his A school. So, um, so they are not here this morning, but we have a power pack Sunday, power punch pack. I don't know, something, something powerful this morning. So, um, so stay tuned. But before we go any further, children, you are dismissed. If you see, you, you can see Miss Sam to uh, your left, my right, right over there waving at you guys. You are now released for Kids Church, and we are so thankful that you guys are here to worship with us. Amarisa, you got your praise on this morning, but I'm going to worship you the rest of the service, so we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll see how that goes. But um, yeah, a uh, couple quick announcements. Starting Thursday, we have our... Um, our breakthrough class, Freedom from the Inside Out. Uh, we'll, we'll have flyers on that, and we're going to have a whole bunch more. We're going to have the introduction class today, actually, so you'll be able to experience that. And then Tuesday, we have our men's, our women's, our youth, our children from 6.30 to 8. If you're not plugged in, get plugged in. We've had some powerful times these last couple of weeks in our uh, men's group, women's group, and then in youth and kids. I'm, I'm sure they're doing something awesome. Anyway, so um, let's just pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. God, that you are in this place, Lord, that you are wanting to do a work in us. And so, Lord, right now, we just give you permission to have your way. Lord, let your spirit fall in this place. God, I ask that there will be signs, wonders, and miracles this morning. Lord, come and do what only you can do. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. And before we go any further, I'm going to ask Diane to come up and share a testimony. She's going to give a two-minute testimony on, on, on a good... You, you like I put that time limit on there for you? All right, here we go. So my aunt doesn't believe. She knows of God, but she's chosen not to believe him. And um, a few months ago, we got, she got upset. And you could completely hear the fear in her voice because I said I wasn't going to do a vaccination. And she said, he'll never see me again and have a mom with him. She's been my second mom my entire life. Fast forward, um, we get back from in the middle of July. She calls me. She's been diagnosed with breast cancer. And I said, Lord, come on. Like, no. Like, she needs faith. She needs to know the miracle working God that I know. Let her know, Lord, come on. Other things have been going on, and I know God, our God, He heals. I completely believe that. And I just kept praying that, praying that, praying that. And the Lord showed me there's a battle going on around her house for her. And I said, come on, Lord, show her, show her. She calls me on Friday, and she says, can you talk? And I'm like, oh, gosh, come on, Jesus. She says, well, I had a PET scan done, and they said there's no cancer. Come on. She says, they're confused. They're having a giant meeting, a bunch of people going to try to figure out what went wrong. And I said, Aunt Leslie, I said, Amen. that's my Jesus right there. Come on. I said, 
that's the miracle working God I know. That meeting that they're having, what they're not telling you is there are files after files after files of people who have been miraculously healed. And they can't explain it. And they're afraid to say the name of Jesus. I said, but you know what? That's my Jesus. And I thank the Lord every day from now and forever for healing her. And she said, you know, a few months ago, she said, the doctor told her, well, you know, we're going to do a scan every six months to a year to make sure. And she says, for the next five years. And she says, I didn't, yesterday, I didn't think I had five years to live. She says, and here today I'm living. And they're planning for the next five years. And I said, and I'm planning for a whole lot longer because my God is a God who of miracle working. And he's taking that fear, and I'm believing he's quenching it, and he's dissolving it, and he's letting it show up about having faith in him, who he is. Not what the world says. The world sees with these eyes. We see with these. And we're just going to continue believing that. And anybody else that needs healing, I'm believing with you. Amen. That's awesome. Praise God. I, I just think it's cool because Diane stepped out of faith with a, with a family member who was not saved and, and was contending, prayed with her, right, prayed for her and was contending for healing. And so I hope that encourages you guys this morning for those family members who might not know Jesus and are battling something that you would contend for them and that, and that uh, or if, if they do know Jesus, that you would still contend that we would see heaven on earth.
declare who he is this morning. Come on. A great I am. A great I am. A great I am. You are who you say you are. Oh, Lord, you are a great I Sons and daughters, regardless of what you're going through this morning or in this season of your life, I just invite you and encourage you to lift your hands and sing out. Lift a sound of praise. Lift a shout of praise. Cry out. Scream out if you need to. God is here, and he will carry you through. We praise you through the breakthrough, oh, through the breakthrough. I sing praises to your name, oh, Lord, praise 
Jesus, to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I sing praises to your name. Sing it out, Aunt Becky. Sing it out. Jesus, the name above all names. We need to declare the name of Jesus. Let's declare him over our lives this morning. Let's declare him over any situation, Father. Let's declare his name. Whether you're giving him praise for what he's doing in your life right now or for you need him to come in and show up in whatever situation you are having right now. Let's declare his name, the name of Jesus in our lives. And Father, right now we pray for those in Afghanistan, Father God. They need the name of Jesus, Father God. They, Father God, you are our way maker, Lord. And we just pray right now, Father God, that you would just show up, Lord. And find a way, Lord. Let's put our trust, Lord, in you, Father. We stand in the gaps for them, Lord. And pray, Lord, the name of Jesus in their situation, Father God. In the name of Jesus, Father God, have your way 
here in our lives as well, Father. This morning, we give you all the glory. Te damos la gloria, Dios. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow, what a powerful time of worship, amen. Oh, man. Well, you may be seated. I don't want to uh, take up any more time. Um, this, this morning, God's wanting to do something special. And um, we have uh, a, really a, a, a friend of the house, Doug Talks, and his wife Sherry have, um, have helped this church in a uh, numerous amount of ways. And uh, they've, they've done uh, marriage uh, retreats here and, and really gave a lot of us tools to, um, to really help uh, find uh, a way of sorting out our problems, <laughs> a way of communicating properly. W one of the things that you say, Doug, that I love is like when my wife and I are in an argument, right, and we're mad at each other, it's not that we're mad at each other. We're mad at the thing that's attacking our bond. And I think that's so cool. Doug, um, Doug's been a professional counselor for 30 years. He's been a pastor, a youth pastor. He's worked with every, everyone, really. And uh, if you name it, Doug's worked with them. So um, we are really privileged uh, to have Doug and his wife, Sherry, here. And um, one of the things that, that, um, that I learned is, is that counselors have access to tools that I don't normally have access to. And, uh, you know, when, when my air condition goes out, I don't call the plumber, all right? I call the AC guy. Or I don't call my landscaper. I don't have a landscaper. But I don't call, I don't call a landscaper to have him fix my AC unit. Plus, at the same time, I don't like buying tools that I'm never going to use. My dryer went out. And I had to buy this one special tool. It was like 45 bucks, and I, I used it one time. So I don't like doing that. Yeah. So I just hired I, the right guy. I'm glad you remembered that from the marriage conference. Yeah. I really am. It's powerful. Thanks it was that. really powerful. Yeah. Doug's helped my wife and I on, um, on a yeah. couple different occasions, and I know he's helped some of you guys. And um, I'm just really excited for what, yeah. for what God's going to do this morning. So I'm, I'm not even going to ask you any more questions. Okay. Other than what's the greatest football team on the face of this planet? 49ers! The, the anointing just came, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm Folsom High School. Anyway. <laughs> I like the Seahawks. But, I, but it's a bittersweet relationship with some other teams. But it's all sweet with the Niners. Okay. Um, let's just be still for a minute, okay? Can we do that? Lord, we, we welcome you. You were here before we got here. You're in, you're in us. You're around us. Lord, we want to make sure you know that you're welcome. And what we welcome is your authority and your lordship and your rulership in this place. So welcome. We also welcome your leading. We ask you, Lord, to lead us and guide us as you promised you would into all truth. So we step aside. When the king comes, we step aside. We stand on the curb. We don't want to be in the middle of the road when you start down the road. So we step aside. Give us ears to hear what your spirit wants to say to us and hearts to understand it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. How you doing? Good? Yeah. Well, the first, I'm just going to tell you, don't ever go to the first service. There's a bunch of weirdos in there. I mean, just, you know, I'm just telling you, I don't know how your worship leader can manage it, but, you know, you remember the first time you went to a, a gathering of Christians that really worshiped the Lord? Do you remember that? I do. I was in a living room. It was on November 1st, 1972. You know, it's back in the, I'm a Jesus freak, in case anybody's wondering, uh, and uh, if you don't know what that is, just Google it. You'll find out. <laughs> I'm a Jesus freak. I got saved during the Jesus movement. I was 16. I was a middle linebacker tied in for Tulare Union High School. Any Redskins in the room? They call it the tribe now because they don't want to offend anybody. It's a tribe. Is there a Redskin in the room? Okay. Anyway, they call it the tribe now. It's okay. Whatever. Uh, so I, was, I, I thought I was pretty big stuff. And I just uh, was afraid of not being popular. That was my biggest fear in life growing up, was being unpopular. And uh, so I, I became popular in the course of my life. 
Now I'm 16. I'm a junior in high school. I've got a brother who's a year older than me, the Tox brothers. Everybody say that, Tox. When Doug talks, people listen. So uh, my, my, my name, Doug Talks, is a complete sentence. Did you know that? So it's true. Thank you. I'm glad somebody recognized that. So now, now I go places and people go, this is Doug Talks, and his name's a complete sentence because they've heard me say that. So, um, so I was 16, and I was... Uh, you know, like a typical 16-year-old, man. I, I love sports, love girls. Uh, up to that time in my life, I'd been in several fights because I grew up watching my father uh, uh, basically abuse my mother verbally and, and physically. And uh, so I grew up seeing that and wanting to protect my mom. But I was just a little kid. I didn't know how to protect her. So every time I saw somebody pick on somebody, I got in a fight with the person picking on that guy. And I would go into a rage. I'm pretty sure they based that. Remember that TV show, The Incredible Hulk, during the 70s? I'm pretty sure they based that on me. So people used to say about me in high school, don't get talks mad. Don't get him mad because then it's going to be all over. I just was doing what I was doing, and I would something would trigger in me. Do you know what a trigger is? Something would trigger in me. You all know what a trigger is? So something would trigger. A trigger is when... Something from your past suddenly shows up in your present, and you think it's happening right now, but it really happened back then. That's what a trigger is. And when we're in a state of being triggered, we, we, don't, we don't function very well. And so I, I was, uh, that was just kind of who I was. And I had become to this place where I was really happy with my life, and then I ran into a bunch of weird Christians like we're in the first service. I, I don't know what you're like yet. I just started talking. But there's a bunch of weird people, man. They're like raising their hands, they're like singing, they're doing all this stuff. And they're hugging each other. That was not a thing. I did not hug guys when I was in high school. Okay? I wore cowboy boots and man, I was like not hugging dudes. Okay? <laughs> and I saw these Christians hugging each other and just slapping each other, you know, just loving each other. That was the first thing that attracted me to Jesus. Seeing people treat how they treated each other. And it wasn't very long before I started thinking, this, this way I'm living and thinking is kind of empty. I would rather be a person who's free to just express my love and share my love and, and, and uh, embrace people. I'd rather be that way, but, but uh, it was just a kind of a passing thought. And then on November 1st, which is, does anybody know what November 1st is? All Saints Day, I missed it by like five minutes because it was midnight and boom, I'm in All Saints Day and I became a saint. And uh, I was the third time in my last few months before that, it was the third time that somebody had given me an opportunity to make a choice, to make a choice to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior because he has to be both. He doesn't just do one of them. He, he's got to be the boss, and he's got to save me. Because if he wasn't a boss, he ain't saving nobody. You feeling me? He ain't saving nobody if he ain't the boss. So if he's not in charge, he's not going to save anybody. So this is the third time I'd said no twice already. And there was a guy named Richard. We'd been singing in this room, worshiping the Lord, and he tapped me on the shoulder, went to the back room, and, and he he's asked me at some point, do you want to accept Jesus? And I said, no, I'm not ready. In that moment, I could see, picture in my mind, I could see all these people that were my friends over here. I knew they didn't like Jesus freaks. They, they, they didn't want nothing to do with them. And over here was all these Christians and it was like in my mind, they're all over here going, come on, man, cheering me on. And these guys are going, no, no, don't be stupid. I can see all that in my brain. I think the Holy Spirit was moving. And I said, I don't think so. And then God gave him a word. God said through him, Doug, and I, and I was a, you know, big kid, jock, proud of that. You know what a jock is. It's an athletic supporter, in case you don't know. And so uh, 
because I was very supportive of athletics. <laughs> okay, so um, he said, Doug, God wants big men too. Man. Oh, you got to breathe right there. And it just penetrated my spirit. And I gave my life to Jesus that night, All Saints Day. I'm pretty sure I was the first saint of that year in 1972. Anyway, on Monday, I went to school. I was standing in a group of people. And by the way, by Monday, I already knew I was different. By Monday, I already knew the difference between light and dark. By Monday, I'm not saying everybody has the same experience, but you know what? I know a lot of people that would tell you a similar story. If you haven't had this experience, you may not know Jesus. I'm not saying you don't. You just may not. I mean, I've led people to the Lord as a counselor who have been going to church for years, and I start asking them questions, and pretty soon they're, they're accepting the Lord. So I go to, I'm standing around talking to people. I'm nervous about it because I know my friends are going to find out. I know by the end of the week all my friends are going to know. And they're, I've heard, I, heard how they, I saw how they treated Christians in my school. And I knew they were not. Now, I was probably the biggest dude to get saved in my school, the first big dude to get saved in my school. There was one other guy before me who was a pretty studly dude. I'm not saying I was studly. I'm just saying <laughs> he was a pretty cool, tough guy. But anyway, so I go there, and we're standing around in a circle, and this guy, you know, and why is it always the skinny Christian that does this? But he walks up. He's not afraid of anything. He walks up and goes, Doug. Walks into the circle, goes, tell him what happened on Friday night. <laughs> no, Saturday night. And I was full of fear. I mean, full of, I could barely breathe. And I got it out. I said, I became a Christian. And the whole circle gets quiet. I go, what? Like all the heathens, I mean, not un unbelievers. <laughs> They all kind of got quiet, you know, and I, I, was, and I was more scared because, like, oh, man, here we go. All that week, I was afraid. People said things to me, and people didn't say things to me. I was just as bad. By the end of the week, everybody in my school knew that I'd become a Christian. And, but by the end of two weeks, I didn't care anymore because the Holy Spirit helped me to be, to not care. Do you know how many people are afraid to just tell somebody about their faith? Uh, I'm just wanting you to know there's a lot of people. Matter of fact, well, I heard a statistic that just shocked me. 70% of Christian married couples have never told each other how they became a Christian. I'm not saying they're afraid. They're just 70% of marriage couples have never told each other that they're, how they became, came to the Lord. It's probably higher than that if you think how many Christians have never told anybody that they've come to the Lord and they're shared their story, your testimony, just your testimony of how you came to Jesus. You know, you cannot mess that up because it happened to you. you. The only way you can mess it up is if you change the story. All you got to do is tell somebody what happened to you. And I have shared my faith with a lot of people. I've introduced a lot of people to Jesus. And I will tell you, I've been talking to people who their knowledge scared me at times. I'm, I'm a big believer in sharing the gospel. I'm that before I'm a counselor. Jesus is the wonderful counselor anyway. So I have seen by just planting seeds of my test. I've been talking to people who are so smart, educated, uh, far, far more than me, and could run circles around me intellectually. And I just say, hang on a second. This is what I tell them. Hang on a second. Can I just tell you what happened to me? I, I don't want to talk about Zen asterism and all this other thing. And I just tell them what happened to me and the Holy Spirit's, you can see the Holy Spirit getting all over them. And they're, they're like getting really quiet. All of a sudden, all that knowledge don't mean nothing. There are, that is one thing God calls every believer to do. Every believer is to share their faith. And I just shared my faith with you. I just told you something. Jesus said, for, for while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I came to the Lord because God, God came after me. 
He came after me. He sent people to me to tell me about Jesus. And by the way, if you're here today and you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, there's a line behind me, and he's not going to stop. He is not going to stop until you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And right now, if, if you're one of those people, you're nervous right now. That's the Holy Spirit tugging on your heart. You're nervous and you're anxious, just like I was. So I was a youth pastor, and that's why I talk this way. This is, this is how you talk to kids. If you want them to grow up and mature in Christ, you just lay it out there. Hope you're mature enough. I think you are to, to receive it. So I just shared my faith with you. I just All I did was tell you my story. So could you bow your heads with me? All I did was tell you my story. And I told you it for a reason. If you have not surrendered your life to the lordship of Jesus Christ, that means he's the ruler of your life. He's in charge. And you have not believed in him as, as Messiah, which is Savior. If you have not chosen to believe by faith that he wants to be your Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. And don't let fear talk you out of it like it did me several times before I said yes. So if that's you, I'm going to pray a prayer, and all I want you to do is agree with me. If you agree with this prayer, God's going to change your life. He's going to show you what it means to love people. He's going to give you power to love people, to forgive people. He's going to give you power to walk with him. So let me pray this prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, why don't you just pray it with me, even if you know the Lord. You probably prayed something like this already, right? So if, if, if you're going to pray this for the first time, pray it out loud. Dear Heavenly Father, I bow my knee before you. I'm done bowing my knee before other people and things. I surrender my life today to the lordship and the authority of Jesus Christ. And I choose to believe by faith that you are the Messiah. You are the one who was sent to this dark world to save me and many others. In your name, amen. Can we put the passage up for the morning? Thank you. Can you read this with me, please? It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Let's read that again. Read, read it boldly. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Stop right there. That's what I just did. I, I didn't know I was going to do that, but <laughs> I just did that, didn't I? Isn't that kind of weird? Anyway, he has sent me, say that, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. Now, let's just, let's just leave that up there, please. Just leave that up there because I want you to see that. Maybe you have, uh, maybe you, you could open up to that in your Bible. I want you to see that because, because part of what's happened is um, this passage was quoted by many other people in the Bible, and Jesus was one of them. Jesus quoted this when he was in the tabernacle. He basically said, I'm the one that God has sent to be the Messiah and the Savior of the world. Other people quoted it, David and other people in the, in the New Testament. So here is this very pivotal, powerful passage that, that, uh, that talks about wounded people. And part of what we're here, what I'm here for is that I'm doing a workshop this next three weeks. I'm doing a workshop. It's called Healing from the Inside Out. And one of the topics is going to be, what does it mean to be wounded? The, a basic biblical definition of wounding is, you ever heard the term dysfunctional family? Of course you have. My, one of my pastor's friends, he, always, he likes to say, let's put the fun back in dysfunctional. So... Um, Dysfunctional basically means 
you, are you ready for this deep insight? Dysfunctional means you're not functioning the way you were meant to function. Something, you're wounded, you're broken, something's not working, and you're not operating and working the way you were designed to work. And so when we talk about brokenhearted, something that's broken, we're saying that this thing has been broken, that's us, it's been broken, it's wounded, some translations use the word wound, it's been damaged, okay? What's been damaged? It could be a lot of stuff. So what, what possibly could have been damaged? When we live in a state of being broken, a bunch of stuff breaks. One of the things that breaks is our courage and our boldness. As a matter of fact, if you do a deep dive into this passage, that's one of the things that gets damaged, the ability to be courageous in the face of fear, just like what kind of went on, what, what happened to me. People came around me as a new believer. People came around me. They didn't let me back down. I mean, we were driving down the highway, and I'm sitting in the back seat, and they pull over, and they pick up a hitchhiker. This is right after I was a Christian. He gets in the back seat, and the guy driving, he goes, Doug, tell him about Jesus. That's how I learned how to share my faith. I was scared again. What gets broken is the supernatural ab ability of God to help us be brave and overcome the things that we're afraid of. The primary thing that we're afraid of that causes wounding, it isn't what happened to us in the past. And you know, everything that happened to you, it was in the past. Because whatever's going to happen to you tomorrow, it hadn't happened yet. So if, if the enemy has lied to you and said, whatever happened in my past, it's not important. If the enemy has told you that, it's a lie. You don't have anything but right now in the past. And right now was already gone. Today, this moment is going to be your past. So when something gets broken in us, the, the definition of wounding and brokenness is shattered pieces of the past. That's the biblical definition of wounding. The pieces of my past have been shattered. Here's why God is so amazing. It just blows my, my mind. You know, when the Bible was written, they didn't know anything about the brain. But Romans says, pay attention to nature. Pay attention to the natural, and you'll find God. How many of you know that says that in Romans? Kind of uses the, you know, the trees. The in the stars, his handiwork, I see. So the Bible affirms, pay attention to the natural. Did you know that your brain is a natural thing? It's a material thing. And God created your brain in such a way because he loves you. Some of you have been through terrible trauma in your life. Terrible stuff has happened to you. God loves you so much that he gave you a brain that could manage your trauma. And so even as a child, if you went through terrible stuff, your brain will take the traumatic experiences of your life and break them into pieces. Let me go back for a minute. The definition of wounding, the biblical definition is broken pieces of the past. This is what we know about the brain. It will break the trauma of your life into pieces and store them in the back of your brain because you can't handle it. If, you, if they all came together at once, you would probably have, some of us, not all of us, but you might have a nervous breakdown. You might, you, you might just lose touch with the reality. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? It has to break it up. But one of the things that happens when it breaks it up sits back here. One of the things that happens is that's really close to the rest of your body. It's right by your uh, backbone. And so what happens is whatever you experience, whenever you experience fear and trauma, anxiety at a high level, it goes down into your body. It is pretty much has been proven several years ago. It's called the mind-body connection that many diseases are the result of how we think. You hear me? Somebody said something. Somebody just... So that means what you did right there was you agreed with something I just said. 
That means it's going to influence your thinking. You may not totally understand it, but if you agree with something I say, it's going to influence you physically. It's going to influence you emotionally. So we know that many diseases are rooted in how we think. Just think about that for a minute. Many diseases are. Probably, I mean, not all, but I mean, there's some, I'm not talking about physical damage to your body, like a broken leg or a headache, or I'm not talking about, I, I was healed miraculously. We had a, heard a great story about healing of cancer. But even cancer can be the result in the fruit of how you think. Matter of fact, it's amazing because I asked a guy one time who, who survived cancer. I said, well, what, did, what were some of the things they had you do when you're in the hospital? He said, they made me every day make a list of things I was thankful for. I had to write down things I was thankful for. You know, the scripture says, be thankful in all things. Here's why. Now watch. This is really cool stuff. If you're in a state of thanksgiving, you feel completely different than when you're in a state of criticism. You, you feel completely different. Emotionally, you feel different. Because when you're in a state of thanksgiving, so the Lord, this is something God's had to work on me with, so what, what, God, the Lord taught me, before you get up in the morning, tell me some things you're thankful for, and, and when you go to bed, tell me some things you're thankful for. Because back when I was struggling with depression, I was waking up in the morning, and I was thinking about all the stuff that was going to go wrong that day. Didn't even know I was doing it. But I was thinking, one of the first thoughts of the day is, oh, it's going to be a long day. And I take a sigh. It's going to be a hard day. I take a sigh. I should have been saying, Lord, thank you that I can actually get up. Thank you that I got a home. Amazing wife, Sherry. Sherry's a flight attendant. I met her. She was flying with Pan Am. I want to share something I'm thankful for. This is Sherry over here. Wave, honey. She doesn't like to be centered out. Anyway, so... She was flying with Pan Am. You ever heard of Pan Am? They were like these mystical fairies, the flight attendants of Pan Am. They were like these just surreal people. And she had her flight attendant outfit on. Uh, yeah, there were some hormones floating around, I'll just tell you that. But, uh, and I'm just so thankful that I met her because she had a shirt on. It said, marry me, fly free. <laughs> you guys don't travel much, do you? So, Because when you're married to a flight attendant, you fly free. So it said, marry me, fly free. I'm not kidding. It said, marry me. Well, it wasn't the moment I met, met her. But she did, when she started getting interested in me, she did put that shirt on. Anyway, <laughs> so marry me, fly free. I did, and we do. So... When whatever you think controls what you feel, okay? So think about it this way. I think you're going to understand this. Think about when you're in a state of anxiety, whatever it is, you know, you, you lose your job, you don't have the money to pay the rent, whatever, whatever trips you, whatever triggers you. Think about when you go to that place, right? When you cross that line into that state of intimidating fear. Think about how you feel. Now, you may not be able to do this right now, but the next time you do that, I want you to try something, but you might be able to do it right now. I want you to stop and focus in on what's going on in your body. You, you're not doing that. You're probably tensing up. I mean, I don't know if people have, their chest starts pounding, people get hives, all kinds of stuff. Everybody's different. When you're in that state, your body starts rebelling against it. And it's because of the emotions that it produces. There's a chemical called oxytocin. It just shuts off when you're in a state of fear and anxiety. And whatever the negative chemical is, and I can't think of it right now, it just kicks in and it starts poisoning our bodies. This is what happened in the body of Christ over the last year and a half. People turned on each other and tried to devour one another. It's a phrase out of Scripture. How many of you know that was going on? It's pretty sad. We turned on each other. You know, a, a body, the human body has these things called immunoglobulins. I could barely say that. That's, that's what I sound like when I pray in tongues. Anyway, 
So they have this immunoglo- they, 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 tr- they destroy the, the, the bad stuff in your body. We were destroying each other. So what, happened, what happens is God designed the body of Christ to bring healing to the body of Christ. So it started with the Lord telling us through people, his prophets. We're back in the Old Testament. It started with him telling us that God loves us and he wants to heal our broken hearts. That's, he used people to do that. He sent them to us. I call them sent ones. And then he, it, while they were telling us, they were letting us know that Jesus is going to come too. He's going to send Jesus to do that. Jesus Christ. I'm going to send him to you. Now watch. So he tells us, I'm going to send Jesus to you. Then Jesus gets here and he says, I'm going to send you to each other. Jesus said, I'm going to send you into all the world. I'm going to send you to each other to bear one another's burdens. I'm going to gift you. I'm going to gift you with gifts and abilities and a personality that's going to be able to bring health to the body of Christ. It's called the body for a reason. I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you my son. He's going to send you, and he's going to send you the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to send you to the body of Christ. You with me? It's very important. And here's the other thing. As he sends you, I don't know if you've ever had that experience where the Lord sends you, and it doesn't have to be dramatic. I mean, you're here. God sent me here today. I was teasing the first service about that. He sent me here. But here's what I want you to hear. He also sent you here. Not, not just to hear a message. I don't know why he sent you here. But if I walk into every situation wondering why God sent me there and not assuming that I just showed up because I felt like doing it, if I walk into every situation wondering why did God send me here and I'm looking, and as believers come to me, he sent those believers to me. That's a different way to think than some of us are thinking. And if I'm aware of the fact that he sent me, that means he gave me authority to do whatever it was he sent me here to do, which is to set at liberty, to proclaim freedom to captives, to proclaim the day of the Lord, to heal the brokenhearted, to bind up their wounds. You with me? That means he sent me. And actually, you know what the good news in that is, is that the pressure is kind of off me because you're also sent. That means you have a part too. Some people are afraid to help people because they're afraid they're not going to be very good at it. But if I'm thinking that, wait a minute, that person has a part too because you sent them to, here's their part. Here's your part because it's me, I'm here. Here's your part. God sent you. Anytime he sends anybody, he gives them authority. Anytime God sends you, if you are sent by an ambassador, by the police department, you have authority. Man, you know, here's what I want for you guys. I really want you to learn how to walk in your authority. Man, I want that for you. You know what breaks my heart? Is watching people struggle with all kinds of infirmities. Watching people struggle. You know, they're ki- you know, you know, kids are in major anxiety right now. Kids are their anxiety's off the charts. And don't let anybody tell you it's because of COVID. They're in anxiety because their parents are in anxiety. Sorry, I, I didn't have <laughs> I'm just telling you the truth. Kids are mostly influenced by their home environment. We And I I put myself in that same category. I walked in anxiety for eight months of the whole, when the whole COVID thing started. I was a little mad too, because I was two weeks away from going to Italy with my flight attendant wife. I was not happy about that and two other friends. I had to get over that bitterness. And anyway, so, because Italy closed down first, you know, who closes a country? Well, now we know. Anyway, so that fear was crippling me, and then I came to the realization that it was crippling me. I don't know, 
if you know who Neil Anderson is, but I want to read something to you that he's had a big influence on my life. I want to read a quote to you, and I want to, I want to start wrapping it up here. Listen to these words. The most important belief, remember I said what you believe or what you think influences your emotions. See, here's what we do. When we, when we get emotional and we get triggered, we almost always do this. If it's in relationship, we start blaming the person that's in our, in our atmosphere. How many of you know what I'm talking about? This is what we do. We just start blaming and condemning. That's called the spirit of condemnation. So when we get scared, we look for somebody to blame. Because fear is telling us to blame somebody else because it's too embarrassing for you to be a responsibility. It's called fear and shame. So we start looking for someone else. The brain's going crazy. The body's going crazy. The biggest influencer of your emotions is the things that you believe. If you believe you're a loser, you're going to feel like one. If you believe you don't, you don't have a purpose, you're going to feel purposeless. You, hear, you hearing what I'm saying? And your body doesn't like it. Your physical body doesn't like it. Neil Anderson says, the most important belief we possess is a true knowledge of God. So the Bible talks about the knowledge of God. That's what we're going to learn about in the class. Is a true knowledge of, of who God is. Two primary influencers, a, tr a true knowledge of who God is as children of God, and a true knowledge of who we are. So two, no two knowledges that are provided by the Spirit of God. Not, not because we figured it out, we got enough information. Two, because the knowledge of God always involves the Spirit of God. Amen? So the knowledge of God always, it also involves reason and logic and feeling. So whatever we believe, the most important belief we possess is a true knowledge of who God is. The second most important belief is who we are as children of God, okay? Now watch, because we cannot consistently behave in a way that is inconsistent with how we perceive ourselves. We cannot behave and we cannot feel, I would add that there, we cannot feel what it feels like to be a child of God if we're believing lies about who we are if we're believing lies about who God is. And we live in a time, we live in a time right now where a lot of people are leaving the faith. We live in a time, and we're grieving about it. The body of Christ is grieving, and we're grieving, and I mean, I know people that have left the faith. Jesus said it was going to happen. Hey, a lot of them are coming back, amen? amen? A lot of them are coming back. Guess whose job it is to bring them back? Us and God. The Lord's going to send you to some people. So here's, here's what I want to ask you to think about as we kind of go into uh, a time of ministry. Come on up, Jamie. As we go into this time of ministry, um, I want you to think about these th three categories that are, this is just a, something the Lord gave me, which is really cool because I use it in, in every aspect of my life. You know, Jamie introduced me as a counselor. I'm actually, I don't really think of myself as a counselor. Um, but because I do so many things besides counsel people, and I love counseling people. If we can get the body of Christ activated and released with the gifts they have and without fear, we're not going to need counselors. And I'm okay with that. The body of Christ is powerful. God has been sending people to you. Today, I'm just one of them and trying to help you get free. So here's the pattern we go through when we're under attack, when we've been wounded. Here's the pattern we go through. Number one, we try to survive. We go into survival mode. Our brain goes into survival mode. Our body goes into survival mode. That's the first thing we start to do. Thank God. 
Some of you, when you were kids, you would not have made it had you not gone into survival mode and found ways to survive, found places to just survive. You didn't have a safe home. You didn't have a safe haven, but somewhere God provided you a safe haven. And there's all kinds of ways we, we, we can learn to survive. And at some point in your life, you started fighting the battle. And it, by the way, the battle has to happen next. This is the second part. It's the conquering part. You ever heard that verse, we've been made more than conquerors? You, don't, you, don't, you can't be more than a conqueror if you don't know how to fight. And what we're talking, what we're going to learn about in the class is how to fight our thoughts, how to defeat our thoughts that are driven by fear so that you can walk in thoughts that bring emotional healing and health to you and your family and yourself and your body. So we try to survive. Some of you are still stuck in survival mode. Some of you are stuck in conquering mode. You're just battling it out. You're trying different things. You're trying to figure out how to win this battle. We're gonna, I'm going to show you how to win the battle. And today, some of you are stuck in number one. Some of you are stuck in number two. You've been fighting, and you're starting to, loot. You're starting to grow weary because you, you, you've, you've been told to fight a certain way, and it might have been good, but you haven't been told everything yet. Did you hear me? You don't know everything yet. Nobody does. So you're going to learn some things that you don't know. Or you're going to learn how to apply them in a way that you don't know. So that next stage is the battle stage. It's survive, conquer, and the third stage is overcome. You know you've overcome. You know you've overcome because you have less triggers in your life that are controlling you. When you do get triggered, your recovery back to peace happens faster. Do you understand what I'm saying? You are able to recover from that trigger and get back. Nobody's asking you to be perfect. So we want to minister to you and pray for you. And if, if there's anybody here who feels like you're stuck in survival mode. See, it's not good to stay in survival mode for too long. It's not good. It's not healthy because you start thinking like a victim. That's how you start thinking when you, when you stay in survival. I just got to get by. I just, I'm not going to get much to eat today. I just need enough to keep me alive. That's survival mode. You with me? Anybody watch that show alone? Survival show? I, I'm, I used to teach survival, so I, I love that show. And they keep their clothes on. Anyway, um, if you're in survival mode, you're struggling with victim thoughts of poverty thoughts, I'm not gonna, I don't know if I'm gonna make it. Those are the kind of thoughts you're struggling with. And I wanna invite you to stand up if you wanna begin the process. We're gonna finish it this week. Try, we're gonna try to finish it. We wanna try to get you headed back on the path of your destiny. That's what we're trying to do. God wants to free you so you can enjoy who you are and how he made you. So if you feel like you're stuck in survival mode, we wanna pray. I wanna pray with you. Jamie and I wanna pray with you. If that's you, I want you just to stand up. If you feel like you're in battle mode and you're just fighting all the time and you're struggling, but you're fighting all the time and you just can't seem to get into the overcoming mode, then I want you to stand up. Come on, stand up. Survival, overcoming. Now, if you're already in the overcoming mode, by the way, everybody here has an area of your life whether you're either stuck in survival or you're stuck, stuck in battle mode. Everybody does. You may be tearing it up in some area, but if you're here today and you feel like you're, you want to pray overcoming prayers, I want you to stand up and extend your hand towards the people that you just saw stand up. Just extend your hand towards them. If you're ready to pray, stand up and do it. If you're ready to do that. And for those of you, it's just your choice, okay? You can come, I want you to, if you want, you, for those of you that stood up for prayer, I'd like to invite you to come down here. This is not a, I know this place gets a lot of activity, right? I want to invite you down. Jamie's going to have some words for you. Come on down. And by the way, if you don't come down, it's because fear is trying to talk you out of it. Stop listening to fear. Is that how, you know how you overcome fear? You overcome it. That's how you overcome it. So yeah, come on down here. We're going to, nobody's going to get embarrassed. We're just going to pray. I'm going to lead you in some prayers. And I want to be able to see you because it's just more personal. I, I, I like being able to see, look at people, see them in their eyes. Uh, I'm going to ask them a couple of questions. Do you want to say anything before I do? Sure. Um, I'm going to read this scripture that Doug shared in the Amplified. 
It says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed and commissioned me to bring good news to the humble and afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the wounds of the brokenhearted, to proclaim release from confinement and condemnation to the physical and spiritual captives this morning. I am praying for marriages and I'm contending for marriages right now in the name of Jesus that they will be released from confinement and condemnation. You know, Doug was sharing in the first service and something that he said that was really powerful is there's a lot of times married couples struggle because they don't know what their purpose is as a as husband and wife. And this morning, God is going to do something in each of your own hearts so you find out what your purpose is as a married couple. You know, sometimes the the opposite of faith isn't fear. Sometimes the opposite of faith is what we could do in our own efforts. And this morning, God is wanting to strip us of that. It's not about what we can do. It's about what he can do. But will we allow God to do something? Or will we try to rely on our own power, on our own strength, on our own resources? Or will you this morning say, God, apart from you, I am nothing. Apart from you, I cannot be the husband that I need to be. be, I'm not good enough to be the wife that I need to be or the mom that I need to be, the dad that I need to be. Apart from you, I am nothing. It's really important in times like this that we not be in a hurry. So important. I want you to say this as a statement of faith. I am not alone. God is with me. One of the things the enemy's tried to tell you is that because you had bad stuff happen in the past and what's been in your heart is where was God when that happened? This is a very sensitive issue. Some of you don't even know you're thinking that. So look, Let me pray that for you. Because if you're thinking that, I want to give God a chance to free you from that lie. Because that's I run into that one a lot. Where where was the Lord when that terrible thing or terrible things happened to me? So, Lord Jesus, I pray for everybody in here. If that lie is in there, we call it out of the darkness and into the light. Bring it to the minds of those you want to know the truth about that. Bring it to their minds. Bring it to our minds. If that lie is under the surface telling me if you get hurt, listen to this. This is the Holy Spirit. If you get hurt again, I won't be there again. That's a lie. Anybody hearing that? So can I, can I lead you in a prayer to renounce that lie? You have the authority to renounce that lie. So pray this with me, because you got to pray it if you want to use your authority. Lord Jesus, I renounce the lie that you were not there in the past when bad things happened to me. I don't know all the truth about that, but I want you to bring it to me. Lord Jesus, I need your knowledge. Bring it. I need to know what I need to understand to be free of that lie but I know say this with me I know it's a lie because you have said you'll never leave me or forsake me so I'm confused but because I know that it's a lie I reject it I reject the lie that you weren't there and you left me alone I renounce that lie in Jesus name Lord show me what I need to know so I can be free of the lie and I can be stronger. I can stand in the knowledge of your truth and become powerful to help others be free. Amen? Did you hear that? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I just feel like we need to be speaking life over marriages. Yes. Spouses need to speak life over spouses. I I just keep hearing the thought, I'm in a lose-lose situation. I'm in a lose-lose situation. And and I think some of us have come into uh, agreement with that lie, that because you're in this marriage, you're in a lose-lose. And so, Doug, would you lead us in a prayer to to break that? I'm glad you circled back to that. 
Yeah, because some, for some of you, the lie, one of the lies that's hurting your marriage is the one we just prayed about. You may not realize that. Some of you are struggling because whenever there's trouble in your marriage, you start believing the lie. Well, God wasn't there for me. Maybe this person's not going to be there for me when it gets tough. Do you hear me? We have a lot of thoughts we don't even know we're having. But the Holy Spirit will tell you what thoughts you're having. And the ones that are lies, he's going to tell you for one reason, he wants you to destroy them. And I would say one of the most most of spiritual warfare happens in the context of marriage because everybody comes into marriage with a whole baggage full of lies. Lies like, I'm not really worth being loved. I have no value. I don't have a purpose. What's the point? Do you know if you believe that you are loved and you have a purpose? at a knowledge of God level. You may have heard it for years, at a knowledge. How many of you want the knowledge on that? Knowledge of God. How many of you want to know it so you're not afraid when you get rejected? Look, we don't need to be walking around afraid of being rejected, even by our spouses. The number one fear in, a, in conflict is the fear of rejection and losing a relationship. It's based on all kinds of research. The number one fear is the fear of rejection. And Jesus said, you're going to be rejected. You're going to be persecuted. He wouldn't tell us that if he didn't, wasn't going to give us the help to deal with it. He wouldn't tell us that. Somebody, listen, I, I want to share this with you. I love marriages. I want, to, I want to share this with you. Somebody in your marriage needs to decide to lead the way. I'm telling you something you, you probably won't ever, I don't know. It's not common knowledge. It, it doesn't have to. I mean, it would be nice if the man would lead the way. But whoever overcomes fear first, I give you permission to lead the way to freedom. And by the way, you might be married to somebody that's really damaged. And if you are, you're damaged too. You've probably been damaged by their damage. I'm giving you permission. There's nothing in the Bible that would restrict you from using God's authority and power to lead the way to healing. So there's a misnomer and a misunderstanding that women aren't supposed to lead. Hello. I know a lot of women that have led in this area. And you know what? I'm not picking on the guys because a lot of times the men do it. But I'm telling the women because they don't know it all the time. Ladies, when you start leading, you're going to get all kinds of crap. Sorry, that's another Greek word. You're going to get all kinds of stuff. You're going to get all kinds of resistance because you're stirring up the spiritual warfare that we talk about. You're becoming who you're supposed to be, strong and powerful in your marriage. And if, if and you know you're on the right track if you have God's peace when you do it. You're going to have some fire in you too. But you know you're not afraid, you're not intimidated. So I wanted to tell, because I, I know there's some women here that need to hear this. And men too, because I, I was telling last service, men are afraid of their wives. That's another whole point, but men are, a lot of us are afraid, our wives get upset, ladies use that to your advantage <laughs> when you're trying to lead them out of the bondage, you're gonna have an opportunity to lead your, your marriage out of captivity, and it's okay if you're the woman in the marriage or you're the man in the marriage, it's okay, but I'm just telling you you will encounter resistance because that's the battle part, the conquering part. You've got to conquer and get to the place of overcoming. How many of you, you don't need to raise your hand. In your heart, how many of you women are ready to do that? And how many of your men are, are ready to do it? I'm not just talking to the ladies. Because like I said, I mean, I kind of say it humorously, but men are kind of afraid of their wives. And I've talked to a lot of guys about this and they, they kind of go, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of afraid, especially when she gets mad at me. <laughs> That's why a lot of men don't lead. I, I know it sounds silly. Listen, God's speaking to somebody. Men don't lead because somebody gets upset. You know, there's a lot of parents that don't parent because I've had parents say, well, they get upset. I'm not going to do that. What? It's called battle. <laughs> so I want to I pray for you uh, on that part. There's, there's probably some more we're going to do about that, but I just feel like I want to loose you and release you 
to recognizing what Jamie said. You are getting angry and you're blaming somebody for your anger. You're angry because you haven't figured out what to do yet. That means you're mad at yourself. Did you hear that? This is like, this is like good stuff right now. You're mad. By the way, it happens when you're parenting your kids too. You're mad because you haven't figured out what to do. You tried the reasonable thing and that didn't work. And you're just mad because you've tried stuff and it hasn't worked. And then you get mad at that person. Be angry because your bond, your sacred bond that holds you together is being damaged, it's being torn, it's being attacked. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. First of all, I want you to, if you're here with your spouse, I want to lead you in a prayer to say a blessing over the bond that you share. Okay, so I want you to look at each other, put your hands on each other's shoulders. Turn and face each other if you're here with your spouse. If you're not here with your spouse, you can pray this anyway. Look at each other. Folks, listen, we're kind of in a spiritual warfare zone. Take the hand of the person. If it's your spouse, take their hand and face each other. Okay? You will notice in Scripture when Jesus gives instruction, he isn't general. He isn't vague. So let me give you that. Okay, so I want both of you to pray a prayer. I'm just going to pray a prayer. I'm not asking you to do it. Hey, I, this, is the, this, is the, this is how I do it. So people have to sit there and wonder how to do it. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and you repeat it, okay? I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Both of you pray as I pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray your blessing. Both of you pray. I pray your blessing over our sacred bond. I renounce every weapon formed against this bond. Lord God, you brought us together, and I declare, let no one tear us apart. Not fear, not doubt, not insecurity, perfectionism, shame. I renounce those weapons in Jesus' name. And I command them to let go of this bond. Father, I come into agreement right now with your heart for this bond. I come into agreement with your will for this bond this sacred bond that connects me to my spouse. And I pray in Jesus' name that you would bless this bond and that you would bless my spouse. In the name of Jesus, I ask you to bless them. And I reject the fear that's trying to tell me, don't bless my spouse. I reject that fear in Jesus' name. Okay, now look at me for a minute. When I talk to couples and I say, in my counseling, when I'm counseling with them, I say, I don't do this every time they come in, but when I say, I'm gonna have you bless each other, I've had couples go, no, I'm not gonna do that. So here's what, here's what happens when you do that. See, if you let your feelings determine the course of your life, the Bible says, uh, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Your heart is your ability to reason, your ability to, that's your logic, your ability to feel and intuit things, and it also involves, as a believer, the presence of the Holy Spirit. You got three things going on in there. Guess who wants to lead? I just led you in a prayer. The Holy Spirit wanted you to pray. I don't lead people in prayers. The Holy Spirit doesn't want people to pray. I just led you in a prayer that's in agreement with the Holy Spirit. So if we allow emotions to direct the course of our life, that's how you know when you're being lied to. If you're upset, if you're struggling emotionally, you're believing something that's not true. Because when we believe, when we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, when we set our mind on the things above and not on the things of the earth, the mind that is set on the flesh is death. The mind that is set on the spirit is life. When we set our mind on the truth and the knowledge of God, our emotions follow. So what I'm having you do is attack the lie instead of each other. I'm having you attack the lie because the lie drives the emotions that cause you to attack each other. Does that, does that make sense? I mean, I could give you all kinds of examples of that because I'm a counselor. <laughs> Good stuff, this, this morning. 
So you were in the introduction to the three-week class that we have coming up starting Thursdays. We, um, as you exit, we will have flyers for you. It's $25 uh, for all three weeks. And so if, if, if you don't have $25, like, talk to me. Don't let money be the reason why you don't attend this class because God wants us to be whole people. So if you feel like you need this class as a resource um, and you don't have $25, talk to me. We will pay for you. It, it's, it, it's, it's worth it. For you guys to be whole so you could be sent is worth it. Yeah. And so, Amen. Um, Amen. so I'm going to pray in just a minute. As we do, if you have kids in the nursery, go ahead and shoot out and get them real quick because uh, our nursery workers uh, are getting paid overtime right now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. It's volunteer. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> But um, also, if, and this is, I know it's random, um, our credit card machine was down this morning. So if you tithe this morning with the credit card machine, check your bank statement because if, if it's, uh, it might not have gone through. So check your bank statement. You can go to rccegchurch slash give um, and to give your tithes and offering and, uh, and, and, and money to mission. So, um, man, oh, when you pray, this is what you're going to learn in the class. I did, I did a little bit of with you. When you pray and you renounce anything that's designed to take you out, as you're praying that prayer, you're in agreement with the Lord. You're using your authority. And as you're praying that prayer, your body's responding to it. Your emotions are responding to it. If there's an emotion called courage, that's what stirs up in you. I prayed that prayer for 20 years with thousands and thousands of people of all Christian backgrounds. I've prayed that prayer with people who have never prayed out loud before and they get fired up. Now, what I'm gonna teach you is how to pray it strategically, not just always generally, but how to really nail down, have God reveal to you the lies you're believing and then show you how to pray and renounce those prayers and let the Holy Spirit lead you into truth. So you're gonna you're gonna re, you're gonna renounce, repent for believing it. You're gonna reclaim the truth with the help of the Holy Spirit. I'm excited for you. Yeah. Well, good stuff. Well, I'm gonna close in prayer, and then as you leave, we will have flyers uh, with Doug's class, and you can register on there. Um, and again, if you don't have twenty five dollars, talk to me. We will we will totally cover the twenty five dollars so you can attend and so you can walk in freedom. Father, we thank you yes. for who you are, Jesus. Lord God. We thank you for your son, Jesus, Lord God, who, who, um, who not only died, but rose again for us so we can live on the other side of the cross, so we can live in freedom. And Lord, I just pray this morning, God, that, that we would use the tools that, that were given to us this morning and we would be able to apply them to, to our daily life, to our daily thought patterns. And Father, I pray for a recognition of when the enemy is trying to speak lies to us, God, and that when we recognize it, we could come against it with scripture. Yes, Lord. Lord, we love you so much. We give you praise for what you're doing in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you feel like you need to spend a little time at the altar to pray, go ahead and do that. If you have kids, go get them. And uh, if you're new or don't know anyone, hang outside and meet someone um, in, the, in, the, in the church parking lot.